number of you are interested in knowing more about the Baha'i teachings, and that is a wonderful opportunity for any Baha'i to share some of the wonder of what it is to be a Baha'i and what it is that Baha'is believe. Um, <coughs> In 1947, the Committee of the United Nations addressed the guardian of the faith, Shoghi Effendi, and asked what are the Baha'is doing in the Holy Land? What's their connection with the Holy Land? And he answered in a statement about a summarizing the basic Baha'i teachings, which is one of the best introductions that we have to what exactly is the Baha'i faith. Shabi Effendi was the grandson of Abdul Baha, who was the son of Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith. And he was appointed to by the Abdul Baha, who we refer to as the master. He was appointed by him to uh, be the guardian of the faith in the world. And he's provided us with some extraordinary literature and, of course, his guidance in the development of the divine plan of Abdu'l Baha is so important. Can I ask if everybody can hear him? Uh, it's hard. Uh, Shabir Effendi stated to the United Nations Committee, he said that this is the, the center, established center of the Baha'i faith in the world, in the Holy Land because of its founder having been exiled here, having been brought as a prisoner and closed up in the prison of Hakka, and having passed away here so that his remains and the sacred spot of the shrine of his remains is here in this country, which makes this one of the religions of Israel, so to speak. And from a strategic point of view, the one that's most profoundly established in Israel. So he said this is a world religion based on two features. First, the claims of the founder of the faith, Baha'u'llah, who stated what his purpose was and why he came and what his intention was in the world. And on the one hand, that would be one thing that would suggest that it's a world religion accompanied by the fact that its following and organization is now spread throughout all the continents of the world. In other words, he comes, he says something, and it reaches out and it immediately establishes itself all over the world. Even though to many of us, Baha'i is some, a new name, maybe, that they haven't really heard much about it. But it has a profound history and uh, is extraordinarily positioned, from my own understanding, by our Divine Creator to establish the unification of the human race and its relationship to our Maker. Uh, you know, I think you realize that you do not digest your own breakfast. How does all these things take place? All the miraculous maintenance of this physical structure that we have. How is it that it has the power of thought, of weighing things, of choosing things that nothing else in creation has? It would be wonderful, we think to ourselves maybe, if like the animals that we had all intuitive awareness of how to make a nest, how to gather food, how to procreate, everything that the animals have instinctively in them, where do those powers come from? Why do they exist? How do they learn them when they don't have, they, they're separated from their tradition, they don't have a written language or anything. Yet they do exactly what the creation has assigned them to do. It is extraordinary in the sense that everything in the world acts according to the will of its maker, the will of its creator, except 
the human species. God has created mankind to know him and to be able to draw closer to him. But the divinity itself is the divinity of the universe that we're suddenly discovering is endless in all directions. And to consider that we are going to be able to relate to that maker in a very significant way would be unintelligible, really. How can we do that? We like to know, and Baha'u'llah in his teachings, which renew the spiritual teachings of the previous messengers of God, in fact, he said that the voice of the scriptures <clears throat> is a single voice. There's only one word of God, and that's found in all the major religions. Now, some of the religions have added some words of man to it, in which case things get really out of order. And so you have people saying that Islam, for example, is the jihadists have to straighten the world out by killing all the people who don't follow it or something. Or something. I mean, nothing that's in the heart of Islam is anywhere near that kind of a concept, but mostly in the West we have that idea. So there is a need for a clarification of the role of all of these religious teachings of the past. And I think if you examine their holy books, you see that they all revere God, they all stand in awe of God. Some of them are smart enough to fear God. God doesn't say you have to fear Him. Well, He does, He does, but it means something else. It's, like, it's a kind of a love. It's realizing that in our lives, our Father has played a very important role, and if He is not pleased with us, we're not feeling very good about it. But that requires that the Father act the way He's supposed to act, and not the way some of them do these days. And then, under the, that protection, children grow up, and you see in the life of children how there are different stages. We look at them, and we live with them, we marvel at them, it's marvelous things. You see gradually an awareness. You see also a certain cleverness of setting the parents against each other, for example, that children catch on quickly to that possibility. Um, then there's this long dependency and the need for education and the limited powers that children act under until they get to puberty and suddenly all heaven breaks forth, all hell breaks out at the same time because the will that they were exercising was a reflection of their father and their mother's will. That was what made them safe because they knew everything and they guided and protected me and so on. But at that stage, a certain other level of consciousness awakens in which there is a self-identity. But is this what I think? Is this what I believe? It's a tremendous change when you think about it in your own lives and oh, the disturbance it causes also in the world. If they, and people haven't been properly trained, they go off in all directions. Suddenly they're blessed, if you will, with physical capacities, with attractions to each other that they didn't have before. All of which is very beautifully designed to create a perpetuity of the human race so that we, we make with each other and we produce children and population in the future. Now I mention that particularly because there is another stage of consciousness that, for instance, Christ has said that he who is born in the Spirit is Spirit and that we all need to re be reborn, you've heard the phrases said. This rebirth is beautifully elaborated in the Baha'i scriptures and the Baha'i teachings in the sense that that is a new capacity that we have, but it's a capacity that has to be exercised. And this will that we've been given is there so we can exercise on our own selves 
choices between what's correct and what's not correct. And this question of correct and non-correct directly derives or should directly derive from the commandments of the Holy Book. So you've got the Ten Commandments and you have the Psalms and you have the Maxims and the Sermon on the Mount and then you have marvelous uh, spiritual teachings of uh, Islam. All of that is there to help us to make good choices so that we conform to the wishes of those scriptures. It's a terrific challenge. But in that, attending to in our lives, if we begin to incorporate the verses of God as revealed in these holy books, one by one into our lives and think about them, it expands another level of consciousness, which is a rebirth. But in the end, it's nothing more than the way we think and view life. And that is the source of a terrific change that can take place in us. Free will, which the animals and other levels of creation do not have, it is unique to the human species. Free will, where we have to choose how we're going to act. And we have to live with the consequences of what we choose. It comes out pretty quick, that lesson is learned already by the child who say, don't touch the stove. And they touch the stove and they learn that, well, that was good advice and I had it burned if I touched the stove. It's all levels of life relate to that. You know? Despite some new laws which say you can take everything you want out of stores and nobody should bother you. There's a complete breakdown of order presently taking place in the world and causing chaos and difficulties. But also, these are things that spark in us questions that need to be answered. And those answers come from the divine teachings of the manifestations of God. Having said at the beginning, well, how do we relate to the supreme consciousness, the creator, the maintainer, not just the creator who said, well, it wasn't such a good job, so I'm going to do something else. He's the sustainer of everything. Baha'u'llah says that the power of God is closer to you than you are to yourself. It comes from that. Just as we are dependent on the light of the sun and the heat of the sun for anything that grows and maintains itself. In the inner world of our souls, there is a sun of truth. There is a divine light. There is an illuminative power which we can gradually become conscious of. Some of us do it very quickly. Uh, there are extraordinary acts of God. Sometimes in dreams and things we come to realize something very quickly, maybe because it's a, if we don't figure it out, it will be a danger to us. But on the other hand, we have that we can go back to these scriptures and read them. And Baha'u'llah suggests we do that morning and evening to refresh our souls, to take in nourishment for this new level of consciousness which is available to us. Or we can choose to do the opposite of the scriptures and then our lives become more and more difficult and usually we fall into some kind of uh, submission to what you call them, is it like alcohol or drugs or sex or whatever it is that we become consumed with that and it draws us away. And these two aspects have been placed in creation by the Creator so that we can make sense of things. For instance, how would you know what light is if there was no darkness? Could you express, explain to me what health is if there's no illness? The concept doesn't even, it's impossible. It's by contrast that we come to understand things. So some of the tests that we're given, the difficulties that come in our lives, are made to awaken us to those differences. So that we begin making choices on a more continual basis towards perfections, towards choice of good things. 
the manifestation of God as defined in the Baha'i teachings include all, in, in fact, some of the things we come to understand come later, in, not at the time that they're given. The role of Adam, Adam is in the Baha'i teachings that it also is mentioned in Islam, is a messenger of God, is a divine being, is the first of the, of the people of the race in a, in a very profound way that gives the teachings of God and establishes the perpetuity of families. Then we have Moses with the development of tribes, tribal concept. We have Christ and in Jesus' time, social evolution evolved again and took on the character of city-states, small principalities that were self-contained in, in a sense. And in Islam, in the era of Islam, which was, those are the consecutive stages of this revelation, if you want to call it that, the Baha'i teachings say the progressive revelation of the divine teachings. And just as the human being has different stages in its development, the human race has different stages in its development. And these powers and these teachings that the prophets of God bring <coughs> illumine those areas of consciousness. And what is Paola brought in this day now is after the coming of, you know, you've got these basic, at least in all of our experience, we have the Judaism, Christianity, and Islam as preparatory steps, Baha'u'llah says, for the coming recognition and understanding of the oneness and wholeness of the human race. Now, one of the things that people find maybe when they're reading in the Baha'i teachings is that the Baha'i teachings say that truth is relative, religious truth is relative. And they say, how can it be relative? It's either it's true or it's not true. No, it's true, but there are truths that depend on your development and on the development of the human race before they can be introduced. How can Baha'u'llah come and proclaim the oneness and wholeness of the entire human race when in the time of Jesus the world was still flat? There was no concept of the world was something different from what it is when you see it as a globe and you see all the different races and nations that are there. Now Baha'u'llah says the only way we're going to go forward with any peace and prosperity is to recognize the oneness and wholeness and apply laws and teachings that are relative to unification of mankind, to the elimination of all prejudices and hatreds and racism and all these things that have to, has to go. But through these divine teachings, that consciousness of the oneness of mankind strikes us. Who made all of us? It's the same one creator. We have one creator that made all of us. Why, why do we need to fight with each other and kill each other? What's, what's the point of it all? So it needs humanity worldwide to awaken to this new possibility. And this is the one that's promised by Christ himself when he says the kingdom of God on earth, my will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <coughs> it is isn't it? the singularity of Jesus Christ, exactly what his words say. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that operated through him and continues to operate through these other divinely appointed messengers. And that brings us then to a new stage of vision for ourselves and for humanity. I don't know what you may have heard or not heard about the Baha'i faith. It's not a social movement. This is a revelation from our Creator. And the words of Baha'u'llah have this dynamic possibility transforming and awakening in us, understanding of things that are not going to be learned from borrowed knowledge from each other, 
It's a, diff it's a different kind of learning that we need to come to. It's a learning that develops in consciousness. And that consciousness is that state of rebirth. I'm not strange tongues and jumping around on platforms and stuff like that. I'm sorry to all to do that anyway. <laughs> so, we start to cultivate in ourselves that we are a race of people that needs to unite in every sense. And spiritually we are, there is no difference between races at all. We're, spiritually we all have the same heart qualities and we suffer emotions and we have the loves that we do for our children and family and all, all these things are common to all of us. How we got so confused because of really something so superficial as color. Abdul Baha says, do the black sheep not associate with the white sheep? Do the black birds not associate with other or blue birds with the, um, birds of all different colors? Nobody pays any attention to color. Why do we why have we created that really? So he calls for an elimination of but that elimination has to take place by our new area of thinking about things. That we actually choose in ourselves to adopt these truths and let them direct our lives and our actions. Makes a big difference. Um, I mentioned Baha'u'llah had a, a son, Abdul Baha's his title, which means the servant of Baha'u'llah. He was in prison with Baha'u'llah until the end of Baha'u'llah's life in 1892. Baha'u'llah began his teachings about the middle of the 1800s and then uh, passed away just before the end of the century. And he passed the center position in the faith to his eldest son who had extraordinary powers also from God. He traveled, he was a beneficent prophetic figure that came after being released from prison through a revolution of the Turks in which they released all the religious prisoners in the, in the different jails. And he then was free and he came to the West with an entourage and he spoke and he moved across the country here. He was on the West Coast also, he was given wonderful talks and he has done things that nobody could imagine anybody could do, but he had this, this power and this sweetness in him that he was able to proclaim the validity of Muhammad's mission in the leading synagogue of San Francisco to the extraordinary recognition by rabbis and others of this profound truth that he had given. You can read the talk in session. He gave it a very other important talk. He was invited to Stanford and he addressed the people of the university there, the students and the faculty in a talk that's just out of this world, intellectually and in every other way. And he uh, proclaimed his father's revelation. He proclaimed the truths, the basic truths that Baha'u'llah brought, which form the, they circle around the central truth of the oneness of mankind, that we're all one people, and that God sees us as one people, He addresses us as one people. But within that, there's certain other adjustments that need to take place. And one of the important ones that Abu Baha stressed that Baha'u'llah brought is the equal rights and opportunities which must exist for women equal with men in every sense. The Baha'i faith was promulgated by uh, men from Iran and within Iran and in the whole of the Eastern world. And in the West, it was mostly proclaimed by women. Interestingly enough, the great heroines of the Baha'i faith are, are women. And the lives of each one of them is exceptional to read and contemplate. 
the faith was born in Iran and it grew up in this course of Baha'u'llah's multiple exile. It was exiled four times by the rulers of his, the period that he was in, while at the same time he was addressing tablets and instructions to the collective group of kings and rulers of the world, calling upon them, saying, I have been called upon by God to instruct you how to operate in your kingdoms. He's a prisoner in the prison and he's saying that. People could laugh, but those principles that he proclaimed are so sensible and good sense. They're printed in books now. You can read them. They've been translated into English or Spanish, if some of you are Spanish. Reduce. And <clears throat> he called upon them to recognize his mission. None of them did. Their, the first person of royalty was the Queen Marie of Romania. She was taught by an American woman, one of the great teachers of the faith, called Martha Root. And she inspired her so much that the, the Queen wrote, she had a syndicated column in the West that was published in America, David Davy, and she wrote about this wonderful new, new faith. She said, if you ever hear of it, she said, take it into your heart and see how it will change your way of viewing things. Beautiful testimony, she said, about the cause. But the rest didn't, and the Pope didn't, and religious leaders didn't respond. Paola, in a book called The Book of Certitude, said the first proof of the manifestation of the appearance of a new messenger from God is that everyone will attack him. Of course, a human being like, like ourselves is going to stand up and say, I have, I have a message from God for you all. Sure, buddy. everybody's ready to hear that, right? Did they do it in Jesus' time? Would we have recognized Jesus if we lived in that time? This is a, it's a challenge. You know, you say to yourself, what is this Baha'i thing? They think they're going to rule the world or something, or his teachings are going to rule the world. But, yeah, big challenge. And while without the assistance and confirmation of God through sincere seeking and turning to it, you're not going to make it. I'm not going to make it as a Baha'i if I don't do that. I have to make efforts to try to conform my life to these teachings. Okay, the teachings also say you'll never make it. You'll never do it completely because we're human beings and we have failings. So if you're not perfect tomorrow, don't be upset about it. <laughs> it's, part, it's part of the way things evolve. But on the other hand, the efforts that we make to conform to the Baha'i teachings or to the teachings, actually to the teachings of God as expressed by Moses, Christ, Muhammad, and Baha'u'llah. What a marvelous scheme. It means we can all come together. We don't have to be divided because of religion. If it, a careful reading of the teachings, you realize they've all soared in the same heaven. They have spoken from the same divine throne. And the effect of their words, as you go and study them, as you think about it, all of them have this same effect on us. They've been a terrific guiding force in humanity. But these have, stages so far have been preliminary. Now Baha'u'llah says the whole world has to come under with the shadow of one faith, the shade of one faith, the protection of one, one maker. And he just teases us a little bit, he says, and he says, likewise, all the other fixed suns in the universe have planets. And those planets have creatures. And that God is the single unique God of the whole universe. And a whole lot of other things that we don't know anything about. <laughs> How do we know uh, being at that level? And yet, the Baha'i teachings say that the, the maker, the divine maker, is not bereft of will, of his own will. He is not bereft of consciousness. He's not a blind force of nature that we have to put up with just because. And so, he, 
they have the possibility, and you see, you've maybe been exposed to some Christians or others who have such a deep faith, they say that when I pray, I feel he's listening and I feel confirmed. Now that doesn't happen necessarily right away. It depends on sincerity. It depends on the attitude we have towards the whole. Muhammad says, behold ye the signs of God. Behold them in the universe and behold them in your own selves. <clears throat> this is theme is, is again renewed in the Baha'i teachings. The signs of God are all the miraculous things you see around us. Look at the sign of God in a tree that's come from black earth and one little seed. And this whole system evolves. Not only that, so you want to tell, if you wanted to try to speak, this is like, he says, if you want to describe the next world to those in this world, it's like trying to describe to your child in your womb that you're going to come in a world that has a, an infinite sky and it has stars and it has a sun and it has something called trees and on the trees appear fruits and the fruit makes you grow and feel good and right. Endless things we have to think about and contemplate. And all of that helps to create a certain appreciation and humility towards God in the soul. Which is, in the end, that is a kind of a, a satisfaction and peace of mind that escapes most of us these days. Uh, I have a copy of this, uh, and the assembly here of the Baha'is has access to this and can provide it uh, eventually, maybe two years, a copy of this brief resume of history, aims, and significance of the Baha'i faith. And amongst that, uh, summarized, the Baha'i teaching summarized in 22 points it has here that I'd like to read the single line points to give you a little idea of the scope of, of what the revelator has brought. Christ has said, I have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. Albeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you unto all truth. Baha'u'llah makes the claim that he is that spirit of this truth that has come as promised. The Baha'i faith upholds the unity of God, recognizes the unity of his prophets, and inculcates the principle of the oneness and wholeness of the entire human race. It proclaims the necessity and the inevitability of the unification of mankind. Friends, this is coming, whether our generation manages to <laughs> help or not, is is beside the point. It's, this has been infused, instilled into every atom of, the, of our world, of our system here. It's not going to return void to its maker as it, one of those verses in the Bible says that, that the word of God never returns void to him. It always gets fulfilled, but sometimes it takes a long time. Proclaims the necessity and inevitability. Okay, we did that. Asserts that it's gradually approaching. Difficult to understand this presently because the situation of the world is so crazy. And claims that nothing short of the transmuting spirit of God working through his chosen mouthpiece in this day can ultimately succeed in bringing it about. The Baha'i faith says, you're not going to solve these problems through politics. It's a disappointing truth maybe for some people, but you also realize from your own experience and from looking at the history as you know it, that it isn't bringing about much success. In fact, it sometimes acts as an oppressor. Politics in that sense. 
And moreover, the Baha'i faith enjoins upon its followers the primary duty of an unfettered search after truth. We've been given minds and intelligence to be able to consider and weigh things, and we need to do that. One of the most uh, difficult situations of humanity now is the acceptance of what everybody believes. That what everybody believes must be right if everybody believes it. But not everybody believes the same thing. And it, it, it doesn't involve us having to, to judge what's going on. Not that we judge in the sense of arising and being critical, but that we use our own capacity to recognize what's best and true. Condemns all manner of prejudice and superstition. A lot of superstition has entered religion just because that was the people have added. God sends a teaching. Uh, there is one of the stories is God sends pure water, it comes down the mountain. And after it gets to the bottom, people bathe in it, and then they wash their clothes, and they throw their garbage into it, and the pure water has suddenly become something else. He declares the purpose of religion to be the promotion of amity and concord. Religion is to make us all united, it's to make us all feel good about each other. It proclaims the essential harmony with science. Science is the other branch of knowledge besides revelation, and these two have to be in accord with each other. And there's things that religion say and science say that's impossible. And we have to think these things through. There are a few of challenges like that. But certainly he encourages us to get a scientific education study and to have knowledge of all facets of human existence and of those trades and uh, arts that are useful and uplifting to humanity. Recognizes religion as the foremost agency for the pacification and the orderly progress of human society. It's not just something for Sunday morning. Okay. Clear enough, huh? He maintains the principle of equal rights, opportunities, and privileges for men and women, insists on compulsory education. All of this is going to depend on school systems. And along with that, he said that now you need the necessity of a world auxiliary language, a language that we can all understand. So anywhere we go on the earth, we, we feel at home because we can talk. The newspapers will be printed in such a language. He, he doesn't say what language, he says that world organizations have to choose that. They may choose an existing language, they may choose to invent or elaborate on one of the languages that exist. We're pretty fortunate with English because, because of the internet and everything, it's become such a medium of, of uh, communication and so on. But we don't know how that will, will develop still. That requires and the force of majority of mankind. <coughs> he eliminates the extremes of poverty and wealth. He said the governments and the people who have to income and wealth and taxation have to, have to all be balanced so that nobody has an excessive amount of wealth and nobody has not enough to survive. Well, this is obvious. We're a human race. We ought to be able to figure this out. You know, the planet has been bountifully blessed by our maker with the means of industry, the means of agriculture, all these things that we can make a beautiful place out of it. It just requires giving up some of our limited ideas. He abolishes the institution of priesthood. He said, people now have to study the words of God for themselves. We shouldn't have to go to the mediator of what he condemns as corrupt institutions. He prohibits slavery, asceticism, mendicancy, that's begging, and monasticism. Okay, we're in an interim period where there are people begging and stuff for different reasons, but society itself has to take a hold of and raise up the people so they have a standard where they can live decently and honorably, so to speak.
We've gotten out of the 22, we've gotten to 17. So bear with me a little bit longer and I'll finish the list here. He prescribes monogamy. Monogamy as a law. He discourages divorce. He says it's abhorred by God. The whole idea is the, the unification in marriage and the sustaining of sorry. Thank you. He emphasizes the strict obedience to one's government. Since we're not meddling with politics, we shouldn't be meddling with our governments. There are others who are doing that, and there's the whole upset. Baula said if the kings had responded to his message, the state, and state of kingship would be different. But he said we have seized power from two groups, the kings and the clergy. And we've passed them to the people. Now you see the masses of democracy, for instance, become such a strong force where the people are choosing. This is an interim too because we want, we want really to, to live in the kingdom that's reigned and is controlled by these principles. That would be the best world we could think of. He's also said something else. He says that when we're, we're here once we recognize that we're all parts of one creation and we're all brothers and sisters really as a human race, we should serve each other. That acts of kindness and service to each other and to humanity and in or an organizational sense. All of this is very, very esteemed by God. In fact, he says he has elevated service to others to a rank of worship. It's as if you were praying when you're helping other people and doing things. That, he said, also don't think that that means you don't need to pray if you're serving. You have to pray too because prayer is this thing that polishes the, the, that capacity I was talking about at the beginning of recognizing truth and holding the truth re requires cleaning the mirror of our inner being. And it's the repetition of prayers and the reading of the verses of God of all, of all these faiths because the Baha'is study all the holy books that provides that for us. He urges the creation or selection of an auxiliary international language. Here we got to that point. That part of he also delineates the outline of those institutions that must establish and perpetuate the general peace of mankind. So he doesn't say, just go make peace. He says, this is the way you do it. And that is through the development of local uh, community institutions, which can better the affairs and activities in every locality. And he calls for these, he calls them houses of justice. He said, you have to develop houses of justice, but houses of justice requires a certain go governmental position. And it's an interim, he says, he calls them spiritual assemblies. So we have a local spiritual assembly. Are we actually here in the area, there's several local spiritual assemblies. Now that there's no clergy, well, who runs the business of the faith? Out of those who recognize Baha'u'llah, they then have rights. But they also have duties. Baha'u'llah says the first duty, if you will, of every human being is the recognition of the manifestation of God for his time, for her time. As you can see, that's the unifying point. Just that single thing changes everything. So when we do come to recognize that Baha'u'llah has a level of inspiration and we can begin to commune with him in prayer and so on, and realize that that's the way God connects with everybody, then we rec we've recognized and accepted Baha'u'llah as a messenger of God. And that, at that point, you want to be a Baha'i. And it's easy to become a Baha'i, you just have to tell the assembly you want to be a Baha'i. And then you become a voting member of the community and help to elect these local councils which are elected from all the men and women in the community to follow 
the basic teachings of how to organize community life and how to educate the children and how to, so many different things that, as you can see, it's quite a complex, is a university of learning, just as for starters, uh, I think by just the range of what we're talking about <clears throat> here this evening, you can conceive that. There are, of course, many aspects, and there are a number of buys here in the room, which you can turn to to ask different aspects of the teachings. And hopefully they will answer you on the basis of what's written in the Baha'i books and not on their own ideas, which is a temptation for us sometimes to do. I remember when I first heard of the Baha'i teachings and some of the Baha'i uh, teachers that were giving talks like this one, they would say, somebody asks you a question you don't know the answer. Do not be afraid to say, I do not know the answer to that. I will inquire of those who broader understanding and study of the Baha'i writings if, to see if there is an answer and what the answer is. Otherwise, we're going to be thinking up answers as Baha'is that don't necessarily satisfy the people when they hear them. We're all learners. We're all, we are all learners. The Baha'is have a series of institute courses that have been introduced which are like small study circles where people can sit and read together the teachings and the ideas of the faith as a kind of a preparation for greater Baha'i service, which becomes greater service to humanity, and as you will see as, as you look at it. Anyway, that is a, just a few brief ideas. Um, there's all kinds of wondrous things to talk about. Baha'u'llah confirms very much the existence of life after death as a full divine civilization on the other side that is full of every, everything that's here, he said, comes first from there. Everything here is a reflection of a higher realm, an inner state. And it's possible to, for us to understand it until we go there, so don't get too excited about not understanding it. But he does suggest certain spiritual truths that are so uplifting, and he talks about how it's organized there. And of course, you're going to meet all your loved ones and people that you associated with in this life. In the next world, you have the opportunity, not the necessity, but the opportunity of seeing them. And uh, the idea of forgiving those people that have offended us at our individual level is, is a very important. Unity of mankind doesn't come easy. It's, you recognize the truth of it, but then the practice of it becomes the challenge because of the bad habits we've formed. And the guardian of the faith used to say to the friends, when you have a challenge and test, that you have to get to a stage where you can forgive and forget. And I have so many Baha'is I hear say, I can forget, I can forgive, but I can't forget. <laughs> But we need to let go of hatreds and things like that. Keep us from, keep that new sphere of consciousness which is available to us, that keeps it from maturing and developing. Thank you very much.